very much for okay right um i've now been told that the recording is progress so i shall try and start again um it's very good of you to ask me gordon and, and very nice of you all to listen in and uh, gordon i regard in these matters as so often your your word as being law uh, so I will try and, and give everybody my version uh, of the history of Hatfield House. Uh, and uh, uh, I will try and be relatively brief so that it leaves a bit of time for question and comment. Um, some of you, of course, living where you do, may have visited Hatfield uh, in spite of the chronic difficulties of east-west transport in our county. And on a good day, though, it is, uh, I think, relatively easy, neat, relatively easy reach of our county of Hertfordshire. Uh, and for those of you who don't know it, it's a large house. I think, I think you could say a very large house built between 1607 and 1611. And it's situated in a large and very ancient park just to the east of Hatfield Railway Station. Perhaps increasingly unusually for the 21st century, it's still owned, lived in, and um, its estate is still managed by the direct descendants of the man who built it, whose name was Robert Cecil, 1st Earl of Salisbury, who was chief minister following his father to Queen Elizabeth I, and then to James I of England and VI of Scotland. Essentially, uh, the house hasn't changed in its outward appearance since 1611, although the South uh, Arcade was glazed in in the early 19th century, according to family legend, so that Queen Victoria didn't catch cold while she was on her way to chapel during her visit in 1846. Actually, the truth of the matter is that it was glazed in about 10 years earlier, but the, like so often we succumb to better stories. The interior of the house has been changed rather more, um, altered in, in, the, in the wake of fashion and convenience, particularly as privacy became more important. Uh, the greatest depredation to the original interiors took place in the west wing of the house, which is built in the form of an E, when it was gutted in a very nearly disastrous fire in 1835, uh, and um, some of you will know that that event was covered by the young Charles Dickens. And if you remember your Oliver Twist, uh, you will also remember that the fugitive Bill Sykes helps put out the fire uh, on his journey north uh, in the closing pages of the great novel, which rather helps us date uh, when uh, Dickens um, set Oliver, uh, Oliver Twist. Now the house itself was built in rather a hurry, uh, which I think in itself must have added to its gigantic cost, which was, wait for it, £40,000. When you consider, to give you an idea of, of just how mammoth a sum that was in the first decade of the uh, 17th century, the income of the English crown in about 1603 was roughly 400,000 pounds. And it gives you an idea of the extravagance uh, of the builder at the time. Although I must say in our neighboring county of Essex, Audley End, which was also built by uh, a later Lord Treasurer is thought to have cost as much as 125,000 pounds, which is quite a bit more you'll admit in spite of the intervening Jacobean inflation. Anyway, not content with the expenditure on the house, the builder then spent another £40,000 on the garden. Uh, he was um, a great user of the fashionable designers of the day. Much of the garden was, uh, was designed by a Fleming called Salomon de Coe, and um, he also used the celebrated plantsman uh, um, uh, uh, John Tredescant, who was later employed by both the kings, James I and Charles I. I think those of you who are gardeners will know 
the genus Tradiscantia, which was named after him. Funnily enough, Hatfield was not a possession of my family originally. It was a new acquisition for its builder. He'd been left by his father, the great Lord Burley, an enormous palace called Tibbles, uh, spelt, as you know, Theobalds. And many of you will know Tibbles Park near the M25 uh, next to Chesant. The house itself there is long gone. It was demolished like many royal palaces in, during the interregnum under Cromwell. And the final stones were, I believe, removed by Lady Essex, who was a contemporary demolition queen in the 1670s. And I think those of you who know the place will uh, know that there is nothing but uh, a one window left of the original great house uh, stuck in rather a derelict wall. Anyway, by the time Burley left Tibbles to his second son, Robert, at Burley's death in 1598, it had grown into an enormous and elaborate house with five courtyards and very elaborate gardens and interior decoration. Burley himself married twice. By his first wife, he produced a son, Thomas, to whom he left his northern estates, centered around the great house of Burley near Stamford, which some of you may well know. Thomas's descendants still live there, and you will, those of you who know it, will witness to its enormous size, bigger, I think, than Hatfield, and itself set in a beautiful capability of Brown Park. And of course, it's stuffed with the most wonderful tapestries, pictures, and furniture. I strongly recommend a visit, of course, if you don't know it. Uh, but uh, take, uh, take plenty of time. There's an enormous amount to see. Anyway, the old boy's second son, Robert, uh, by his second wife, uh, who was rather a, a formidable lady from Essex, um, who, who, uh, whose portraits, two of whose portraits are, are at Hatfield, was a woman called Mildred Cook. Um, and she was one of five famous blue stocking ladies, uh, daughters of a, of, a, uh, of a very learned man from Essex. It's always said that Burley and his wife, uh, uh, for their pillow talk, used New Testament Greek. Um, looking at her, I can readily believe that. Uh, I think Essex girls have probably changed a bit since her day. Anyway, their son Robert was Burley's political heir, and he became chief secretary in 1596, although for reasons of economy, his miserly mistress, Queen Elizabeth I, used him uh, as effectively secretary for several years before that. After Burley's death, uh, Robert succeeded him as chief minister, and um, Burley realized that for those purposes, he would certainly need a southern base. So in his will, he left him his southern properties, including Tibbles, uh, because, of course, it was placed extremely conveniently close to London, where the monarch of the day could be entertained, the most important function for any senior official. Robert's first great concern after his father's death was the succession. Elizabeth was visibly aging, and there were a number of potential successors waiting in the wings. Of course, if there were a row as a result of various claims, if there were not a smooth succession, there was a real risk of chaos and civil war. So quite soon, he began to plot that smooth succession with the aim of securing the claim of the King of Scots, who he clearly thought had the best claim and was probably the most suitable. I think the, there is still a good deal of uh, speculation about what actually happened. Uh, many of you will have read the extraordinary account of Queen Elizabeth's last days. It is alleged that she stood for two solid days with her thumb in her mouth like that, saying nothing. Uh, and uh, it was clear that the, the, the final moment had come and greatly daring 
her chief minister, the four foot 10 hunchbacked Robert Sussel approached her and said, your grace must go to bed. She looked at him, taking her thumb out of her mouth and said, little man, little man, must is not a word to use to princes. The ultimate put down perhaps, I'm not sure that our present monarch would quite have the nerve to treat his councillors in that way. Uh, perhaps he ought to try it, they need it sometimes. Uh, anyway, she did go to bed and the councillors, the, the privy council who ran the country in that time surrounded her, uh, but the secretary was in charge. He'd seen off challenges already from Essex. Um, those of you who read Lytton Strachey will know how amusing that can be made as a plot. Uh, and uh, he leans over and asks the Queen who her nominated successor should be. Nobody quite knows whether the Queen said anything. But of course, the Secretary then looks up and says, it is the King of Scots. And as soon as that is accepted, he has a messenger waiting down below with a fresh horse who's told immediately to ride for Scotland. And so the succession is carefully organized and it happens without too much difficulty. Although some would argue that the gunpowder plot uh, was one of the direct results of that succession, delayed as it was for a few years, but that's another story. Anyway, uh, the net result was that James became a regular visitor to Tibbles, which he took to, and he came to covet it as he was entertained by his chief minister, just as Burley had entertained Queen Elizabeth I there. So in 1607, just as he had appointed uh, Robert as his Lord Treasurer, he proposed a swap. Tibbles for Hatfield. Robert drove a hard bargain. He took Hatfield and with it 21 Hertfordshire manors. Rather nervously, he rode over with some of his fellow privy councillors to inspect his new property. And it must be said he was not overly impressed. The palace at Hatfield that he found was extremely old fashioned for the day and probably, I would say, not in the best of condition. It's certainly not a fit place to entertain the king and as Lord Treasurer, he was certainly going to have to do that. What he found was a large red brick building built in the 1480s by Cardinal Morton, a good Dorset man from Beer Regis who at the time he built the palace at Hatfield was Bishop of Ely. In form, it was rather like a small Oxbridge college built round a quad with two substantial gatehouses. Morton, like most medieval bishops, was really an officer of state as well as a prince of the church. And it was something which he remained when he later was translated to the Archbishopric of Canterbury. Morton spent a good deal of time traveling backwards and forwards between London and Ely, mostly on government business, and Hatfield was a convenient place to stop off. And although it was in the, in the Diocese of Lincoln, it belonged to the Bishop of Ely, and indeed its parish church a few yards from the palace was, like Ely Cathedral and still is, dedicated to St. Ethel Drida, uh, an, a saintly Anglo-Saxon princess. The palace was set in an ancient medieval park and set about with ancient oaks, many of which are still alive and are collectively one of our greatest treasures. Uh, I have one dendrochronologist report which suggests that the oldest living oak tree we have in the park may be as much as 1700 years old. I have to say that when I uh, asked my friend Thomas Packenham, a great tree expert, whether he agreed with that, he said it was utterly ridiculous. So I, I challenged him to come and debate the matter with the dendrochronologist. And I have to say, I haven't seen Thomas since. So I think it's one love so far to the dendrochronologist. 
Of course, another advantage from Morton's point of view that the hunting was good. Well, it was all too good to last for the bishops of Ely. In the reign of Henry VIII, the king, driven as we know by lack of cash and lust, lust for Anne Bullen, nationalized the monasteries in the wake of his breach with Rome. Ely, of course, was a monastic foundation. So uh, Ely's endowments were nationalized along with all its fellow monasteries. And as a result, the old palace and its surrounding property became royal property and Henry VIII from time to time used it as a golden cage for imprisoning his two daughters, Mary and Elizabeth, depending on who was out of favor at the time. Eventually, towards the end of his reign, he sold it to a, a sort of 16th century thug called Guilford Dudley, who in his turn, early in Edward VII's reign, sold it on to the Princess Elizabeth, who spent much time there, and who in the latter half of her sister's reign, Mary I, was confined there by Mary's order. So it was that famously, Elizabeth receives the news of her sister's death, sitting under an oak in the park on the 17th of November, 1588. She was very good at PR, really a mistress of it. And it was the later to prove, I think, um, her salvation and the basis of, of a much of her legend. And in this case, she prepared herself and just happened to have uh, open on the page in the book of Psalms in front of her, a suitable verse, uh, which was, it is the Lord's work and marvelous in our eyes. It's wonderful what a little bit of preparatory spontaneity will do for historic uh, legends. Immediately, the new queen held her first council in the great hall of the Hatfield Palace. And at her side was the man who was to be her chief counselor for the next 40 years, William Cecil, father of the builder of Hatfield House. Uh, he had been her political and indeed, I suspect, financial advisor for some time, ever since the death of Henry VIII, as he himself became more and more important in the councils of the great and managed to survive during the interregnum of the Catholic restoration under Mary. So by the time William's son Robert swapped Tibbles for Hatfield at the behest of James I in 1607, the old palace was no doubt a bit down at heel, but he might just have appreciated the place's connection with a key moment in his father's life. Well, he needed a house fit to entertain the king, as I've said, and the old fashioned palace clearly wouldn't do. He therefore knocked down three sides of it and used the rubble as a base for his new house, 150 yards up the hill. He extended the great hall in the remaining range and made it into a stable, uh, the remains of which I remember from the inside. Tragically for Robert, the builder of the new Hatfield house, he didn't live to enjoy it really at all. And as for its purpose in life, which was to entertain the king, James I never actually stayed there. <clears throat> Just before its completion, he only came to dine once, and I think never probably set foot in it again. Robert the Builder dominated the political scene in the early part of the reign of James I, <clears throat> just as he had in spite of the challenges like the one mounted by Essex I referred to a moment ago in the last years of James's predecessor, Elizabeth. Yet his power was increasingly challenged and resented. And he found it more and more difficult, I think, to manage the national finances, both under the twin pressures of inflation and the extraordinary extravagance of the king. The stress was compounded finally by the blow of the death of Henry Prince of Wales, who caught a chill after a game of, a game of tennis and died early in 1612. 
Robert was already greatly and grossly overworked, and his health had always been delicate from a child. He was small, hunchbacked, and uh, it was always difficult for him to, to keep in good nick. Um, I think this is probably the final blow. And in the same year, he, he developed cancer and went to Bath in an effort to recover by taking the waters. They didn't do him any good. And in agony on his way back to Hatfield, lurching in the primitive carriage and over the rough roads of the day, he died. He was only 49 years old, and thanks to his massive expenditure building Hatfield and various other places in Dorset and Middlesex and Salisbury House in the Strand, he was heavily in debt. Ever since, curiously enough, his descendants have lived at Hatfield. His son began to sort out the family's finances and was clearly perhaps a more considerable figure than some of his descendants have supposed. Uh, rather interestingly, he joined the parliamentary side in the Civil War on the grounds that the King, Charles I, had no right to try and govern without Parliament, which, as you know, he did during the celebrated years before 1640. Robert's descendants during the later 17th and first half of the 18th century were on the whole a pr pretty, I'd have to say, pretty uninspiring lot. Although they did follow Burley's example of marrying formidable and clever wives, something which my family has been extremely adept to doing. I hasten to add, in case my wife comes in, including the present generation. The sixth Earl, I'm sorry to say, was such a spendthrift that he sold many of his estates, uh, including a great chunk of North London, which he sold uh, to the uh, famous orphanage. Uh, and um, he was in such dire financial straits that he was unable to continue to live at Hatfield. Uh, and he decamped to a small house near Bulldog with a rapacious mistress, leaving his wife and legitimate children at Hatfield. Both he and the mistress, who was a, a formidable lady in her own right called Mrs. Groom, produced nine illegitimate children. And he showered her with jewels and them with an inheritance which he could ill afford to let them have. I've always thought that much of Hatfield's furniture and other chattels ended up with Mrs. Groom, who after the Earl's death retreated to a handsome house in Baldock where she lived in forbidding respectability for the rest of her life. Certainly, unlike at Burley, there is no grand, uh, grand tour booty, if I can put it like that. And from good portraits, we are, we, apart from a few good portraits, we are, as one of my daughters is, is rather fond of pointing out, not Chatsworth, you know. What we do have, on the other hand, is one of the best archives in private hands in the country something of which we are extremely proud. Uh, and the reason it's there is because apart from the first half of the 18th century, when I've explained we weren't at our best, we as a family have always been involved in politics. And as you know, politics generates paper, far more now than it should, but it always has done all the same. Until relatively recently, it never wholly clear where public documents ended and where private correspondence began. Certainly in the 16th and 17th centuries, documents probably remained where they happened to be when the minister died. So many of Burley's and Salisbury's documents remained at Salisbury House in the Strand in 1612, after the death of the builder, uh, with su some substantial part of the remainder lying in Whitehall and ending up in the National Archive today. What are known as the Lansdowne Papers and the Cotton Archive make up a high proportion of the rest. We also have, fortunately, an equally rich collection in our archive from the 19th and 20th centuries, because each generation has also been involved in politics. 
Prime Minister Salisbury, for instance, was not a great delegator and he conducted much of his work by personal correspondence. So there's a vast accumulation of his papers at Hatfield, which had been briefly uh, loaned to my old college at Christchurch, but which we got back uh, about 40 years ago. Uh, it's not only the 19th century, in the 20th century too, my great grandfather, my grandfather, and I, for rather less time, were all MPs and cabinet ministers, and our personal papers all add to our substantial archive, along with those of various relations, some of whom were also in politics. This means that we are fortunate to be able to welcome a constant stream of academic researchers from all over the world who are looked after by our archive team and who constantly add to not only our knowledge, but to historical knowledge on all sorts of areas of British and indeed international history. So for instance, uh, just to take a few items at, at, at a venture, if you want to see the first draft of the execution warrant of Mary Queen of Scots, um, the second draft of which is in Lambeth Palace Library, if you want to see two poems by Walter Raleigh in his own hand, or correspondence with Bismarck, Queen Victoria, or Wellington, or Florence Nightingale, or you want to follow the fight against the appeasers in the 1930s, which my family took a prominent part in, <coughs> or the plot to install Winston Churchill as prime minister in 1940, just to take a few examples. As an academic researcher, you're likely to want to come to Hatfield and come they do, we're delighted to say. Perhaps I could give you some idea of the sheer volume of material we're fortunate to have in our possession and uh, for us to look after. Some years ago, we digitized uh, some of our Elizabethan and early Jacobean documents, a mere 30,000 of them. Uh, and of course, with the 19th and 20th century as paper proliferated, uh, we have many, many more than that. <clears throat> Indeed, we have many more uh, 16th and 17th century documents as well. So if you add about 60,000 books and manuscripts, some going back to the 12th century, you get some idea of the fun we in the world of professional historians have with it all. But there's something else which is also rather exciting. Uh, thanks to modern technology, with the advent of digitization, it becomes much easier to give wider access, and this will become increasingly possible as we pursue our digitization programs. It's also helpful for the conservation of documents because it means that they don't have to be handled so often and are therefore less likely to be used and damaged. Well, that gives you a very broad idea of the history of the place. And as you can imagine, I've left a good deal out in the interests of concision. But perhaps the thing that I find most surprising about Hatfield is that we still exist as an independent, privately owned entity in the 21st century. Uh, we don't take any grants or public subsidies in either the house or the park, and hope that we can survive financially through running our business competently. I know we could probably take a few lessons from you in that, Gordon, particularly. Uh, but that, of course, is not the only prerequisite for survival. I think there is another equally important one, which is this, that in order to survive and prosper, we have to try and play a full part in and to make a positive contribution to both local and even national life. And that is what something that we increasingly try and do. Um, I could give you two examples, perhaps from national life. We have, I recently had a, a, a conference at Hatfield uh, with a number of former conservative and labor cabinet ministers and senior officials past and present to think about the future of local government in our country, England particularly. Uh, we also had um, a meeting of uh, 
officials from all over Western Europe about two months ago um, who specialize in Islamic extremism. And we compared notes about how best we could you know, be positive, but about Islam. Um, and I have many Islamic friends myself, but also to counter some of the dangers which we have been faced over the last 30 years, and so on and so forth. Um, but um, unless we take part in that way, it seems to me that people would quite rightly say, uh, what is the purpose of somewhere like Hatfield? And I hope that uh, as we continue in this vein, make ourselves available and there's a nice place to go and visit, uh, that people might feel if they ask themselves the question that if we weren't there, perhaps they would miss us. But um, how we go about that, I think, is a different subject entirely beyond the scope of my writing instructions from you, uh, Gordon, this evening. So all I would do in finishing before asking for any comments or questions is um, to say to all of you who have not yet visited us, do come and see us. We'd love to see you. And if you have been, please come back. And thank you for listening. Thanks, thanks very much. What a fascinating history. Um, you, you, we only live in these properties or look after these archives for a very short period. We sort of almost visit or borrow the custodianship of, of the properties. And it's an enormous responsibility to hand it on in a better condition to, in your case, probably another generation. And I think a lot of people underestimate um, the responsibility that carries. So thanks very much for doing that. And yes, you've agreed to answer, answer questions. There's quite a lot of people on the screens. There's 46 screens in front of me. Um, if anyone can sh raise their hand, they need to unmute themselves prior to the question. Uh, Peter Latham. Peter. Thank you. Yes, fascinating talk. Um, <clears throat> my uh, my uh, real interest in uh, uh, the history of this country is in two particular periods of time. One is the period when the Cecils were probably the most influential people in the country in the fight for the ascendancy of the Catholic faith or the Protestant faith. The Protestant faith triumphed and I would contend um, that was the start of the uh, age of reason, um, the uh, uh, age of enlightenment and ultimately the um, the modern world, Western world that we see today. And another period uh, when your family seemed to be very much involved was um, in the, as you referred to it early on in your talk, to the appeasement period in the 30s. And your family, you say, and I've come across this before, was influential in getting um, Churchill appointed in 1940. Um, I mean, do you see these periods in, uh, in in history as being so seminal that we might not have been here today uh, and certainly wouldn't have been, uh, our life wouldn't have been anything like uh, the life it is. It would have been absolutely different had either of those events not turned out the way they did. Well, Peter, typically um, learned and and. and tricky question to answer. Um, no, I'm not learned. <laughs> we're, we're, always, um, we're always tempted by counterfactual history, aren't we? It, yeah. it's, my Oxford tutor always used to say, beware counterfactual history. Uh, that way lie dragons. Um, I do think there's a broader question about your first example, the 16th century, and I have an enormous amount of sympathy with what you imply. Um, if I, if you'll allow me to be a, a bit sort of broad about this, um, it, it's always seemed to me that, and this is perhaps parallel with today, that society is enormously changed by technological revolution. And the 16th century is a very good example of this, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, what's the great technological revolution? It's printing. I know printing was started in the 15th century, but it really became cheap or relatively cheap. 
and easy to produce pamphlets in, in St Paul's churchyard, for instance, uh, in the 16th century, which is when, of course, uh, the king tried to control it, and you can see why he did. But what happens is, of course, that it makes information more generally available, particularly when it's available in your native tongue, which, as we know, the translations of the Bible did. And suddenly you find that the people who governed you were not necessarily better informed than you were and that maybe they weren't quite as competent or as moral as you had originally been taught to assume. And that is a great driver for change. And I don't want to oversimplify, but I think there was a bit of that in the 16th century. And if you are able to adapt to the change uh, demanded by the effects of technology, then it may be a bit bloody on the way, which it was for us. It does, as you say, pave the way to um, potential success as a nation. Uh, we managed to get there in spite of the vicissitudes, of the, and partly because of the vicissitudes of the 17th century, but certainly unleashed by the 16th. And the great hegemon of the 16th century Spain didn't change, and that all ended rather tragically. So um, I, I, I agree with that. And I do think that um, one of the things that uh, is a great argument about whether English became the dominating world language because of English power, or whether it was uh, the um, internationalization of the English language or the power of it, um, which, which came first, I suspect, uh, the two were intimately linked. And if you think that there were possibly three major seminal universal texts, all of them 16th century, essentially, there was the, um, uh, the authorized version of the Bible of 1611, which was 75% Tyndall. Uh, and there was, um, uh, there was uh, uh, I suppose, Shakespeare and the Book of Common Prayer. Um, that made all those three things made over succeeding centuries, plus scientific um, research encouraged by the Royal Society and, and, and Newton and all that, um, made England uh, and English and eventually the British Isles extraordinarily powerful in spite of being in population terms a minnow compared to somewhere like France. Um, uh, and, um, you know, there were all sorts of other reasons as well, but I've, I've been rather um, uh, uh, been rather elliptical about this. I, I think also um, the, and by the way, what's rather interesting is we have one of what I think of as one of two extant copies of the first edition of the authorised version of 1611. Now, you quite rightly tell me that there wasn't a, there wasn't a, a, a first edition, and technically there wasn't because they were such a hurry to get it out into the churches. But uh, there was a copy produced for each of the privy councillors for the King and the Queen and the Prince of Wales. Uh, the only other copy apart from ours that I know exists of that particular very small edition is in the, uh, the Winchester College Library. Uh, uh, there is a, another version uh, which is in Lambeth Palace Library and elsewhere, but is not the Privy Council version. Um, and as far as as, um, six, as the 20th century example you give, Peter, is concerned, I'm sure that that was absolutely crucial. Uh, as we know, there was an attempt by Halifax and, and, and various of his allies in cabinet in 1940 to go for a negotiated settlement with the Germans using Mussolini as an intermediary. And Churchill, who by that time had been partly put in by my great grandfather and grandfather's group, which was called the Work Watching Committee, who quite you know all about, uh, who had a great role together with uh, the Labour leader Asquith. Uh, they colluded as a result of a uh, not Asquith, the Attlee, beg your pardon. They colluded uh, as a result of a, a shocked memorandum by Peter Fleming after the Norway campaign. 
uh, to make sure that Churchill became prime minister. Uh, and I think that was much more an event which ensured um, our survival as a nation and indeed uh, the eventual defeat of the Nazis. Uh, so um, long-winded way of saying, yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, Jim Tatchell. Thanks, Gordon. And, and hello, Lord Salisbury. Thank you ever so much for your talk and also for your support of our walk, which is again starting on Saturday. And we hope to see you at some point on our circumnavigation of Hertfordshire and shake your hand as we did last year, which was yes. Uh, was great um, well, good choice. luck with that. It was a great effort. Well, well, we'll see what we can do. But the the question is is not really linked to that, although it's linked to young people, which is something that we think about a lot. And and I just wondered how you motivate young people and how you've motivated your family to take an interest in the place. I mean, it's a it's a wonderful place from from my visits mm -hmm. there. I, I can say that firsthand, but how do you motivate young people to take an interest in the environment locally and the place that they're in and the history of, of it all, which we find fascinating? How do you get them interested? Yes. Well, um, for my own family, I'm very lucky that they are uh, interested and love the place uh, and are very family minded. Um, and some of them are extremely well informed uh, about the history and have ideas of their own. So we're lucky in that. Um, the, the broader part of your question is very timely from our point of view. For many years, we have conducted rather ad hoc um, uh, initiatives involving not only local school children, but um, more broadly based school children, not only to come and talk about history, but also to um, have actors and actresses dress up as Queen Elizabeth and Henry VIII and so on, which have been quite successful. Um, we also have regular visits uh, around the park and estate several times a year in conjunction with a well-known children's charity, interesting uh, children in the countryside and conservation. Uh, but we increasingly feel that we could, should be um, much more coherent in our approach to our educational effort. And we are now looking later this year to appoint a full-time education officer uh, whose remit will be quite broad. Uh, firstly, we think that um, it would be interesting if uh, we made this a common effort between Burley House, obvious connection, and St. John's College, Cambridge, uh, which was Burley's own college and also uh, his son Robert's college. And uh, you might be amused to know that St. John's, since 1583, have been sending us a, a preacher every year, and they still do so. Uh, they do the same at Burley. And so uh, the, the present master of St. John's, who's the first woman master of St. John's, is a very good friend of mine. And I think she's quite interested in this joint effort. And we think that um, we ought to be providing an opportunity to involve particularly local people, but more broadly, across a whole spectrum of educational uh, uh, requirements, from the very, very young, right the way through to postgraduate and postdoctoral students. Uh, and with the resources available to us from those three institutions, we think we'll be able to do that. Um, but we're, what we're particularly interested in is that it shouldn't just be about history, but that it also should be about particularly conservation in the countryside, um, the, uh, the sort of things we do, um, farming, where we increasingly are eschewing traditional methods and, and have a, an overall uh, objective, which is to put more back into the soil than we take out of it as a basic principle. And there are all sorts of new techniques. Some of them actually much older than we think. 
uh, which we are increasingly beginning to apply where we farm. The same with forestry, where the old tax-driven idea of forestry changing between Schedule A and Schedule B, uh, we now have managed to kick and uh, we are fully uh, paid up um, supporters of the principle of continuous cover forestry, which enables you to uh, get by without clear felling, which is, of course, enormously good for uh, the quality of the forest. Uh, so I think we can do that. Now, the one other thing I'd uh, say that within all this, um, I think that your key point, you made an absolutely key point, which is what really matters is how do you make people interested so they, this is not a duty, it's a pleasure for them. And it, 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 it stimulates what one hopes will be a long term lifelong interest, either full time or as uh, a part of a wider life. And um, may I um, descend a little bit into my anecdotage, Gordon? Um, years and years ago in prehistory, when I was an MP, like all MPs, I used to spend quite a lot of time visiting local schools. And um, I went to visit one school which hadn't got a very good reputation in White's, White Regis, which was uh, on the edge of Weymouth, those of you who know it. Uh, and I was told that the maths class I was going to sit at the back of um, uh, had pupils which were 75% uh, of whom were functionally enumerate. And um, I was particularly interested during the course of the, the lesson uh, by the bad behaviour of one small boy at the back, who was clearly not in the least bit interested in what was going on, was behaving increasingly badly. At the um, end of the class, I said, um, would you mind if he gave me a couple of minutes? And I said, I was very interested that you weren't very interested. Um, what did he do in his spare time? He said, oh, I, I, I put money on the horses. Well, I said, at your age, how do you get the money on? And uh, he said, oh, my older brother puts it on for me. So I said, well, I hope you don't mind me asking you a bit of an impertinent question, but do you know what a six horse Yankee is? He said, yes, um, of course I do. So I said, well, if the odds are 11 to 9, 15 to 1, or this, and you put on, let's say, uh, 25 bob, um, what, and they all come up, what does it pay? 30 seconds later, this functionally innumerate child, aged about 13, gave me the answer, which I certainly hadn't been able to, been able to work out, which is something like 892 pounds 50. Um, now, he was interested, um, and um, his interest made him rather better at mental arithmetic than certainly I was, and I'm certainly more than his teacher was. And I think that what we find is exactly the point you make which is that if we show children things which interest them, uh, they're not stupid and they learn much more quickly. I I'm always very amused uh, that when we take people around, the children are always much the most interested in the keepers. Uh, what, you kill things? How splendid. Um, so you're able then to say, well, Actually, that's not the point of a keeper. The point of the keeper is to keep the balance of nature at a time when certain predators uh, are not predated themselves so that the balance can be kept as best we can and it should be based increasingly on science. It's one of the reasons that I'm so proud to be president of the GWCT, whose objective is to base all its judgments on peer-reviewed research. Anyway, again, rather a long-winded answer, I'm sorry, but I, I strongly agree with you. I think that you can stimulate interest, and the way you do it is through um, showing people um, by imaginative uh, teaching, and also not talking down to children who are a lot more intelligent than we give them credit for. Here, here. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, Wendy Turner? Oh, hello. Um, thank you very much for your 
talk a little bit, um, just a quick question, really. You mentioned some of these documents, um, digitised documents in your archive. Yeah. Uh, my question is, are they mostly the domain of your researchers, or would you consider having like an open day where some of us who live in Hatfield might be able to make an appointment to come and see some of them? Yes, well, um, this is an extremely good and again pertinent question. Uh, the digitized documents that we did 10 years ago now are now available in libraries and universities all over the world. Um, Curious enough, the first one to apply to us was the University of Galway. I'm ashamed to say I didn't know there was a university in Galway, but I'm better educated now. Um, and we then had an ambition uh, to put a, a terminal uh, in the shown part of the house or possibly in the stable yard. And then COVID came along and everything came to a stop. So my short answer is, we haven't managed to do it yet, in spite of best intentions, but we hope over the next couple of years, now we're getting back to normal again, uh, that um, we will be able to do so, so that visitors can do just that, plug into it. And of course, the technology is getting better all the time. Those of you who go to the British Library, with whom we, we did the, um, the uh, uh, digitization program, will see they've made astonishing technical advances over the last few years and it's well worth going to have a look they're, they're brilliant at it okay thank you very much thank you any other questions you're getting off very lightly i think yes i think i am okay very well thank you very, very much from their lordships we will um we'll be coming to visit the house as well at some point oh no i've got Mag maggie Tchaikovsky. Has raised her Hello. Hand. Yes, uh, Maggie Gakovic. I'm an employee at University of Hertfordshire. Uh, good evening, oh. Lord Salisbury. Um, may I ask, please, if you were attending the uh, coronation of King Charles III? Uh, yes, I've been incredibly lucky. I, I've I've got an invitation, and I shall I shall be there on the fifth of May. Um, I was also very lucky, not only to go to um, the funeral of, of the late Queen as one of three Knights of the Garter who were selected to go. I, I think because so many of us are either gaga or incapable of walking, I think the the, the choice was fairly restricted. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I, I, I said to one of the, my two companions, aren't we lucky to be here? And she said, yes, I've been pinching myself ever since I got the invitation, so I'm still black and blue. And then we went down to the committal in St. George's, which was another extraordinary experience. Um, in a curious way, although it was full of scarlet and gold and ceremonial, it was rather more intimate and was touching because there were so many friends and servants of the late queen, uh, ranging from keepers and workers on various estates through to friends and the racing world and so on, as well as the great and good of the I, state. I did actually see you there, Lord Salisbury. Oh, did you? <laughs> <laughs> On television. Yes. <laughs> oh, right. Well, I'm sorry about that. But um, I, I will <laughs> probably be hidden behind a pillar in the coronation. It's very different from the one which my grandfather took part in in 1953. It's not nearly so much grandeur. Um, but I think it'll be in its way equally remarkable because I, I'm sure it's right that it should try and reflect um, the change in the country, um, the disappearance pretty well, apart from the ones I have temporarily salvaged of the hereditary peerage, um, the different makeup of the country, uh, but also the different um, standards and aspirations. And I think I pay great tribute to the present King for what he's, uh, the imagination he's shown in, in trying to cater for that. I'm sure that that will be the most enjoyable experience, much. and I'm sure you'll share your photographs with us in time. <laughs> well, it, um, it, it's a great privilege to be there, of course. It is, absolutely. Peter Latham's hand is up again. Uh, it's a very quick one. Um, there was a survey recently which um, indicated that something like, I can't remember the exact numbers, but something like 28% of those under 25 supported the uh, concept or idea of a monarchy. Uh, 
mm. uh, whereas something like 75 percent of those over 65 did do you think this is something that will change and is it significant or is it good is it likely to i saw that survey too peter and and uh, i think it is significant um i don't know whether before the death of the late queen the same survey would have come up with the same result so i don't you may know better than me but um i i take rather a um a, a pragmatic view of the future of the monarchy if I, I can just bang on for two seconds about this um of course i believe very strongly that it is extremely important for an ancient nation uh like ours to have uh, uh as its sovereign um an institution which uh, reflects uh, our history and traditions uh, to which we are adding all the time and and that is an important part uh, uh and why ceremonial matters uh, judging the amount of ceremonial is always tricky uh, but i think there's a practical reason too um I, i've always thought that uh there are i suppose three options for a head of state in a in a, a representative system of government um one is a um an executive president president uh, i think that's quite a courageous thing to have if i our french and american friends would forgive me uh because by definition an executive president is a politician and is a divisive person and uh at a time when countries are increasingly divided, uh, that, it, as President Macron is finding, I was in France last week, um, this is can be quite tricky. Uh, I think the Americans are finding the same thing. The other thing you can have is a non-executive president, rather like the German model. Well, I can see that's fine, but who is the president? It tends to be um, some, not always first rank politician, in rather a, a crumpled suit who does his best. Um, sometimes there's somebody who executes the role magnificently like Mary Robinson did in Ireland. Uh, but uh, it's, it's not quite the same for an ancient people. Uh, but I think it's more satisfactory than an executive president. What I do think is useful for a, um, for a country like ours is in practical terms, is to have somebody above politics who embodies the history and the romance as well as the practicalities of the nation and a constitutional monarchy seems to me to be much the least bad also uh, for those of us who are of an economical turn of mind if you look at the expenses of the french presidency i think you'll find we get rather um, rather good value for our monarchy well well said um i think you've got to be careful with some of these surveys i actually watched the panorama program last night and i suspect it was a republican uh, editor they had on who two, two months ago we've been recommending nicola sturgeon as our first president i'm quite sure <laughs> well there you are the risks are there aren't they absolutely mind you there are risks as well i think we wouldn't have been happy probably with edward the eighth or the duke of clarence so We've we've been lucky. Yeah. Well, thank, thanks very much again. Um, our next speaker is Rebecca O'Connell, who is the Professor of Food, Families and Society at the University of Hertfordshire. The subject of her talk is a very relevant in today's with today's challenges, and she'll be talking about children's experience of food and food poverty in low income families in Britain, which is obviously a real problem. So that just leaves me to thank Lord Salisbury again and invite you all to join me in a toast to the King, Rotary, and those living in so many very challenging parts of the world. So the cheers. King. King. Thank you. Thank, thank you all you. for listening. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Good night.